Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Compression Thinking Series. My name is Ethan Barry, and I'm joined by Robert Doc Hall, co-founder of the Compression Institute and professor emeritus at the Indiana University Kelly School of Business. Doc's career started in engineering and manufacturing. His experience in these fields is what paved the way for his realization that current business models are contributing to the destruction of our planet. How do we get along without leaving too much of a mess? How do we adapt to a changing environment? Well, these are some of the questions Doc has been asking his entire career. This series is about how you can help to make a difference by making nature a stakeholder in your business or community. To do this, we need to change our values. But before we can do that, we need to change the way we think. If you enjoy this series, please don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Doing so helps us spread this program to more people and more communities who may benefit from the message. Now, you may be wondering what we mean when we use the word compression. Well, in the context of this podcast, compression is a reference to the squeeze we are putting on nature. To ease the compression of nature, we need to compress the way we live. Compression thinking is a guide to help us do just this, hopefully before it's too late. So how do you become a compression thinker? Well, you'll just have to keep listening to find out. Today, Doc, we are here to talk about the second principle in your guide to compression thinking symbiotic thinking. So before we get into it, let me provide the definition of symbiosis for our listeners in case they might not know what it is. Uh, Symbiosis is the interaction between two different organisms living in close physical association. So with that in mind, Doc, what is it we're trying to be symbiotic with? Symbiotic thinking is, it's an important chunk of compression thinking, which is awareness that we need to compress our consumption footprints But symbiotic thinking in that is systems thinking with that added twist, recognizing that we are symbiotic with nature. We are, whether we realize it or not, because we're symbiotic with the little critters in our microbiomes. Oh, yeah, and everything we eat comes from nature, right? And we need to eat to survive. Absolutely, And, and so... Whether you realize it or not, you are symbiotic with nature. And it's being aware of that, much more conscious of it, that's that's symbiotic thinking. So there's a long history to systems thinking that leads up to this, and I decided deliberately not to call this systems thinking. Well, what is systems thinking, you know, for the people who might not know, because this has its roots in that. Indigenous people would use some symbiotic thinking because they were very much aware and perceptive of things in nature going on around them and had a pretty deep respect for it. But to be really conscious of things as a system in in what's commonly called the management literature, we got the rise of systemic or systems thinking. And that's thinking of a system as a whole and looking at the relationships between its parts more carefully, looking at the feedback loops and uh, examining it, um, even if it's a live system, so that it's always changing. And before that, uh, even in science or engineering, you had more static models. You were not thinking of of a moving system that might have kind of a life of its own. Well, all that led to systems engineering and and a lot of what we see for software and electronics today, um, including mm-hmm. maybe even right up to the latest buzz, artificial intelligence. And so that's the idea of systems thinking. There has been a, an organization called the Society for organizational learning that emphasized that. And it kind of emphasized where it got to and where we need to go to from there because I've been in their meetings, but most of the people from any work organization would think about improving the efficiency of that work organization doing what it does now or pursuing the goal it has now 
they didn't go symbiotic and say, what's the effect on nature? Are we actually doing something that's useful for our long-term benefit? Are we just continuing to to chase the the slowly fading dream of an industrial society? And that's what's different. So a lot to unpack there. Systems thinking and symbiotic thinking, um, instead of looking at things like A caused B, it's looking at it, it's taking that extra step, right? A caused B because of B's interaction with C and D, right? It's not just these two systems interacting with each other. There's other systems influencing these systems. Yeah, or even A and B may be doing a dance with each other. They're interacting with each other. That's what symbiont is. You also mentioned there indigenous people and our ancestors kind of had a, a more symbiotic relationship with nature. How do we get there from here? Because today, most people don't even know the basics of planting a garden, and I'm one of them. I'm guilty of that. I think part of it has to do with the separation from nature, you know? Like, we don't, many people don't live in it anymore. It's these uh, artificial environments we've constructed for ourselves. And indigenous peoples and those that follow them pretty quickly explained a lot of things with myths. they just tell a good story, and if it satisfied them, they would go on. You know, the Greeks were classic with this. Uh, what was the sun? Well, that was Apollo riding his chariot across the sky. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not having the instrumentation to probe much more deeply, well, if the myth satisfied you, well, and you can't explain it any other way, well, go on. In some ways, that's what a scientific hypothesis or or at least a conjecture is today. It's a nice story, but science began to emphasize that you gotta you got to go for uh, what you can see that's real and establish a cause. And so over the last two, three hundred years or more, we've more and more wanted to identify a cause or causes for the things we see, and meaning we would gather evidence or observe evidence and try to draw our conclusions and do the best we can. Um, sometimes that's pretty simplistic, and sometimes uh, people thinking that way would revert to form, and they would, instead of doing their own thinking or checking on what evidence was cited, they would just take an expert and say, well, okay, there's Joe, and he knows a lot about this, and so must be so. And sometimes you don't have a choice. If if you, if you you're consulting a medical doctor and you don't have time to probe into everything that might be going on with you, well, he's the doctor, so he must know. May or may not be true, but that's the doctor. And getting beyond that, going for a root cause is has been a pretty big step, and that's gone on for maybe a hundred years. What do you mean when you say root cause? Like, um, I guess just looking for the roots of whatever the issue was, right? Yeah. What what caused the cause? The cause? The cause that made this little problem happen? You know, it's like the, the one from a manufacturing plant where the bearing burned out in the machine. So the immediate thing is the bearing shot. So replace the bearing. But why did the bearing burn out? Well, because it wasn't lubricated. Well, why wasn't it lubricated? Well, because the operator didn't know it was even there and had a place to lubricate it and didn't think it was his job to do it. The thing is, in such a bad position, you can't get to it. Or even worse, the job descriptions of people in the factory left out that somebody is supposed to lubricate the bearing. And so uh, what's the root cause? And that still doesn't get you down to the purpose of the machine or anything symbiotic. Take the same thing and apply it to a business or to, uh, for that matter, a bureaucracy, a government organization. And uh, originally, the the industrial engineers would run through four M's analyzing a problem, man, machine, material, method. And if you hadn't thought through all four of those, you hadn't really analyzed the problem yet. You might use a lot of tools to do that. This was to make your observation more comprehensive. And if you extend that to a business and to marketing and to other functions of a business, 
the list of the M's might get out 10 or 12. And today, most companies, I think the better ones anyway, the, the first concern analyzing a problem is safety. It's not an M, but they do that. And so we've made tremendous progress in that form of systems thinking, being more comprehensive, looking at what we do. And, and you can hardly resolve a problem with a computer without thinking more that way than just doing the quick fix. And so we've come a long way, but we're still not at symbiotic. That forces questioning of why you're doing what you're doing and what its effects are going to be now and maybe way in the future and maybe at some place far removed. And also, it kind of takes us back into that unknown territory, right? You know, if you're talking about our ancestors, you know, the Greeks and their myths, right? Nature is so complex that even at this point in time, we probably only have a fraction of the, the picture. Yeah, uh, there is no such thing as the a theory that explains everything. Or as the cartoon character Charlie Brown once said, uh, but the, anytime I've figured out where it's at, somebody's moved it. And so you, you never get to the bottom of these things, particularly with living systems. Uh, you bite with a machine, but not something strictly mechanical linkages, but not with something that's living because it's kind of like our dog. It has a mind of its own. And to really get into this emotionally, you got to think something like deep ecology. What do you actually feel about your relationship with nature? If you don't sort of feel something, you don't have that mind movie running in your mind. It's going to trigger, how do I think about this problem? Let's try to get into this a bit more in-depth for our audience because it is complex. And that's a very important point to make is people, most of us have blind spots. For instance, when someone pours a harsh chemical down the sink, we don't see what happens to it, right? We don't think about that. There are limitations to our perspective. Oh, yes. Uh, if you're talking about toxic chemicals, people... Flush, uh, flush those down the toilet all the time. If it's gone and I don't see it anymore, well, it's gone. No, it's not gone. It's went down to the, in most cities, it goes down through the sewers and, and into the uh, sewage plant. And what's in a sewage plant? Well, a bunch of antibiotics for one thing, maybe some toxic chemicals. Can you get all those out? Probably not. And so they'll do the best they can, but a bunch of this stuff just plain flats get re gets released. Or, or one that's right now a fairly easy one is nitrate fertilizer. If you put it on a garden, if a farmer puts it on a field, well, that's the end of it. And for several years, people doing that would deny that this had anything to do with the dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi. But it's the accumulated... A concentration of all those nitrates that goes down there that forms that dead zone. And that's one of the bigger ones of maybe 400 dead zones in the world. This is a little local habit or problem that we have that blew up into something that's a pretty well-known global problem. If you turn the whole ocean into a dead zone, you're dead. What are some of these other, you know, flaws in thinking that we have now that kind of fly in the face of reality, you know, like things that we do, behaviors that we are acting out that aren't symbiotic and we think of them as normal. The obvious one is the shopping habit. If you got the money and you can afford it, buy it. If you didn't like it, send it back. You get done with it, throw it away. And so our perception tends to stop at point of sale or point of disposal. And so that severely limits our idea of systems thinking, much less symbiotic thinking. And expanding your awareness beyond sort of your transactional environment, the world in which you live, that's a big chunk of it. There are all kinds of implications of this. Yeah, because, I mean, it goes so deep. It's so unlike how we think today that I imagine if society as a whole was truly to become symbiotic or at least, you know, at least half of the people or even just a quarter of the population started to truly live symbiotically, it 
The implications are huge, right? Yeah. So the idea is uh, localize an economy, reduce the consumption, simplify the processes we use. The simpler it is, the, the less likely it is you're going to make some mistake or some error will occur. That's well known in quality circles in almost any work organization. But the drive to expand and to do something different just never ends. We, we've been living on a lot of energy, and you can just find so many more things to do with it. And we've never done that before, so let's just do it. Oh, yeah. And the system is so needlessly complex. It's very fragile, right? I mean, if energy prices go up so far that people like me and you aren't able to get to work, right? I mean, my job, I have to drive 25 minutes across town, you know? How long would it take me if I had to walk? Well, you'd probably start figuring out how you could live closer to where you worked if you wanted to continue working there. Well, you have some of that going on right now. There are all kinds of little skirmishes occurring in the Strait of Hormuz. You're coming out of the Persian Gulf. If you had a real conflict there, and let's say you sank several oil tankers right in the middle of that thing, it'd take a while to unblock it, even if the hostilities ceased. And you got a big chunk of the world's oil that comes right through that passage. Well, I don't know what would happen exactly, but globally, you would immediately see a reduction in fossil fuel energy use. Most likely, some places would have to go on rationing. Wouldn't like it, but they'd have to. And that's thinking from the point of view of today's economy. Are there any examples of this being put into practice that people could uh, look to for inspiration? Any communities or individuals or groups? Yeah, the people that are really doing something, unlike me, which is, you know, I'm still not part of some intentional community that's oriented towards building your own little local uh, economic system. Do much more to take care of yourself, reuse, you know, might even go back to darning socks. Uh, because why throw them away if you can patch them a little bit and you can keep going. And so before we had all this, people naturally thought much more that way without being terribly aware of anything technical in the environment. They just thought that way. Well, the way we're thinking now, it's it's relatively new. You know, this lifestyle, this way of living, it's only gone on for maybe the past hundred years or so, wouldn't you say? I mean, do you, do you think it's possible to get back to where we were, Doc? Uh, well, you never can get back to where you were. Um, the Industrial Revolution began maybe 250 years ago now, and our consumption of the things we do with it have accelerated ever since. And they continue to do so, and that's that's the huge problem we have. And it's becoming a compression problem. We're, we're squeezing the earth way too much. We're in a sometimes called overshoot. And that's the sort of thing we'll, we'll have to fix. And, it, and to do it, you have to um, change our life habits. You know, you, you, you can get into, you know, the studying your navel with, the philosophy of this, but exactly what's work. You know, Mark Twain defined it as something that you didn't necessarily want to do, but you had to do it because you got paid for it. Well, is that what it is? What's success? Well, success by the current economic paradigm is a very different thing from success if you're thinking life cycles and continuing all life successfully in perpetuity. That's very different. Yeah, so I guess kind of looking at those two different goals, modern goal would be kind of the successive lifestyle that we see on Instagram or reality TV. The goal in the compression thinking society would be just living comfortably, right? Not trying to rock the boat or anything. And that's okay as long as you're not consuming a whole lot of stuff doing it. Uh, people used to provide an awful lot of their own local community entertainment. In a few places, they still do. That's quite different from making a business out of entertainment. Now you can, if you're real, real lucky, 
get rich. And so you, you'd think of the uh, of your talent as sort of a money multiplier. You know, if you can impress more and more people, the more money you make. How would you ra- like to wrap this up? Well, the final punchline is that the essence of compression thinking with symbiotic thinking is really becoming comprehensive, seeing what we really do, not a dollarized representation of it. And that's a wrap, folks. If you enjoyed listening to this, please feel free to join us in our weekly teleconferences where we discuss the problems you and your community are facing while trying to think of possible solutions. The problems we're up against are way too large for any one person to tackle on their own. It takes all of us coming together. These dialogue sessions happen every Tuesday. You can participate by calling the number provided on our webpage. Times, topics, and the number to call are all found under the Compression Thinking Series tab on our website www.compression.org. Also, please do not forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If we're going to make a dent in some of the issues we discussed today, it will take all of us coming together, and your support helps. I know it feels as if we've merely scratched the surface of this topic, so if you're interested in learning more, you can check out Doc's many papers, videos, and book reviews at the same website, www.compression.org. Thanks for listening, everyone.